Dr. E. Michael Jones, how you doing? Good. Good, Ethan. Good to be here. Yeah, it's good to be here. Uh, sorry we had to switch the times around. Uh, Jim had some stuff going on during the holidays, but uh, I wanted to bring you on just, just a little bit early, about 15 minutes early, to talk about Michael Voris. Um, and I know that's a little bit of old news now. It's been about a month. Um, but we covered it a little bit on the kill stream, and I know you literally wrote the book uh, on on Michael Voris. Uh, what are your thoughts on on what's happened at Church Militant? Well, as I said in the book, I said character is destiny, and I think this this collapse was inevitable. I said that seven years ago, and time proved me right. Because uh, this guy is first of all, I got involved with him through uh, one of his benefactors. He interviewed me up at his studio, did a good job of interviewing me. Uh, uh, but then the, his past caught up with him. Uh, he was uh, a, a flaming homosexual, just involved in going on gay cruises, stuff like that. And then he tried to have like a turn on a dime and have an instant conversion to being a defender of the Catholic faith. Well, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. You've got all these bad habits. Uh, it, it would take years to get over them. Uh, I, I think we all underestimate the effect that homosexuality has on the human soul. It's 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 not like fornication. It's 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 a sin against uh, the sixth commandment, but it's a sin against nature as well, and it has a really distorting effect on the psyche that needs to be healing. And he didn't do it. He tried to disguise his past. He you know, sucked me into an operation. Uh, uh, that uh, where I didn't uh, understand where he was coming from. Uh, and so uh, it caught up with him, it blew up, and I wrote the book and I tried to warn everybody about what was going on. And I guess it was pretty much ignored. So he continued, we offered to do and uh, make a deal with him where I would go in front of the camera and he would go behind the camera uh, because he has a lot of expertise in that regard. That's like depriving you know, a heroin addict of heroin. He needs the spotlight <laughs> because of his. He needs the spotlight because of his homosexual narcissism. He's got to be the center of some type of cosmic drama, and that's what he was doing. Uh, and so I wrote the book. Uh, everybody ignores the book, and then thank God. He, I'm sure he said a prayer of thanks when Cardinal McCarrick got caught with his pants down. A homosexual scandal. This put a lot of money into his operation, which he then proceeded to piss away on lawsuits, vindictive, frivolous lawsuits, building a big studio, so on and so forth. And then it started to decline after that. And then finally, I think he, he, the, the the struggle uh, to maintain this double life of the the homosexual and the Catholic crusader got too much for him. And I think he started to basically turn himself in. Uh, which is a, a lot of times people do this. They will turn themselves in. The classic example in literature is Dimsdale in the Scarlet Letter. You know, he couldn't get over the guilt, and so he turned himself in. Well, Morris started turning himself in by texting pictures of himself, half naked or naked, maybe I didn't see all of them, uh, to post them on gay websites. And that caught up with him, and they, they kicked him out, and the whole thing blew up. And that's where it stands now. Now, let me ask you this. First thing, we can hear you just fine, but I think that your mic is coming through your computer instead of your um, very nice microphone right there. Um, so we can still hear you, so it's doable, but um, it, it's, it's, a, it's... Can you... little technical uh issue here usually my fault when there's a all technical right issue. there you go now, perfect is perfect. this better yes okay, good. perfect good per we can still hear you uh but it just sounds a lot better right now um okay, good. and you know I, I, again you know I, I know a little bit about church militant they they went after jlp and some other people um but uh, I, I don't how did this guy get to where he he got 
basically. I guess that's that's the next the next question because um, you know he he used to allegedly literally run a, a gay pornography company. And and I'll ask you this as part of it too. Um, first off, do you think it sounds like you do think you could get over stuff like that? You know, all things forgiven through Christ. Um, if you work at it, right? Like if you're serious about it. Um, it didn't seem like he was too serious about it. I don't know. I can't judge whether he was serious or not at the beginning. Okay. He may have had, he may have had a conversion experience. I don't know. All I know is that uh, St. John Chrysostom said that the sin is the arrow and you can remove the arrow, but the wound is still there and you have to heal the wound. And he never healed the wound. The wound is the bad habits as you acquired for years of going on gay cruises. It's a little bit like alcoholism, okay? It, it, uh, it, the, you didn't, it did, you didn't get into this mess overnight, and you're not going to get out of this mess overnight. Uh, and that applies be, even with forgiveness. I, I have no doubt that God can forgive any sin that we can commit, but that doesn't change the fact that you, you were wounded by when you committed that sin, and you need to heal the wound by penance. That's what penance is. And he never did that. He was going to go from the, the jump right off the gay cruise, walk down the gangplank, and then stand in front of a microphone and be the crusader. He's going to be the Savonarola of Ferndale, Michigan. Well, I think that's crazy if you think that way. And it, it caught up with him. Now, but the, the, uh, there, go one, ahead. The one, thing, one thing I'd like to say, though, is go ahead. The, the, this is the second time around with Michael Voris. And I'm saying that the story this time is not Michael Voritz. It's all the people who threw the money at Michael Voritz after I wrote the book exposing him. Why did they do that? Why did they do that? And I think you have to go to uh, the letter of Tim to, to Timothy, Paul's letter to Timothy. He said, in the end times, people will not tolerate sound doctrine. And they will gather to themselves uh, imposters who will pander to their lusts because they have itching ears. That's what we're talking about here. You're talking about a lot of people with itching ears for one reason or another, who want to be uh, feel superior to the Catholic Church, who just love the scandals in the Catholic Church because it makes them feel better about their own disordered lives. I think that's what was driving this thing. There's another corollary to this, which is silly women obsessed with their sins. This is what St. Paul said about the people uh, in that letter to Timothy. I think there's a lot of that out there now. Now, I, I went through this uh, in Philadelphia uh, in the 60s, watching all those, I went to a private Catholic school, LaSalle High School, watched all those Catholic girls' schools around that area. Uh, the nuns succumbed to feminism. Uh, the girls started acting out sexually, and you can still feel the wreckage to this day. Now, once you act out sexually, chances are you're going to get pregnant. You get pregnant, you may have an abortion, and at that point you become a soldier in the Jewish army known as feminism. And that's what happened to a lot of these ladies, and that's why I'm saying that uh, you have a Jew now who's governor of Pennsylvania. There aren't enough Jews in Pennsylvania to like a dog catcher. <laughs> but you've got this huge mobile uh, fem uh, group of Catholic women, guilt-ridden Catholic women, who are going to prove that they were right and, and God was wrong, and they become mobilized politically in a thing, something called feminism. Now, what do you see? Uh, so I see a lot of people. First off, there were a lot of church militant people who supported him you know i was reading through the comments and you know we wish you the best which is not you know that's a christian thing to say right you know we wish you the best but uh it it, it almost seemed like a little bit um i hate to use the word cult uh but like this this is their guy right uh and um they're so committed to him that they're not um actually uh, comprehending the, the level of his sins. And it's not even his personal sins. Uh, it's that he was leading a public facing, um, y you know, re religious group. Right. Uh, and, uh, I think what you said, uh, you were kind of complimentary in a lot of ways, like, Hey, you know, you're good at some of the things you could, 
you do, but just stay behind the camera, right? Because this thing is is definitely going to blow up uh, eventually, and that's what happened. Yeah, I'm glad he didn't take my offer because it never <laughs> would worked. He he he's impossible to work with. That's what these last six years have proven. He's impossible to work with because of his homosexual narcissism. He's always got to be the center of some type of uh, cosmic drama. And but the people, why did the people follow him? Because he pandered to their lust. That's what he did. He did it, and they fell for it because they wanted to be pandered to. And that's what you get what you pay for, and that's what they got. Now, do you see now? And Jim Goad's here, so we'll get, we'll get into that in just a minute. But um, what um, what do you see as the future for Church Milton? No future. They're bust. They went bust. They had to sell off the asset. The only asset they had were two buildings. They had to sell them yesterday because of a libel suit that uh, is being way, uh, uh, held, uh, tried against uh, Boris because he, uh, according to the chancellor of the di diocese in New Hampshire, uh, uh, slandered him. So they're moving forward. Uh, there's going to be, he's going to lose that case. He testified uh, on, on camera and to the court that he has absolutely no assets. He's got no money. He's completely broke. And he's planning to defend himself, uh, you know, pro se. So it's over. My, uh, Church Militant was Michael Voris. Uh, Emerson said, every institution is the shadow of one man, is the length and shadow of one man. That is certainly true of uh, uh, Church Militant. He would never allow anyone to come close to having his stature in that organization. And so now there is no organization. It's bust. It's uh, bankrupt financially, and he's gone. Uh, now, uh, how, he got a I mean he got a lot of donations like it was a well supported uh organization so he, he must have just burned through all that money like you said on losses yeah yep he pissed it away on various things an extravagant lifestyle it's pretty much documented in the in the court documents the worst thing I think was the frivolous lawsuits uh, they cost a lot of money. Lawsuits cost a lot of money. He yeah. went through. He want. He wanted to uh, 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 have a permit to have a protest in Baltimore. The city wouldn't give it to him, so he spent a million dollars to get a permit uh, for a, a, a rally that nobody showed up for. That was really stupid. That's the type of reckless behavior that this guy engaged in. All right, now I think Jim Goat is here. Are you here, sir? Oh, I'm here. Jim, right. good to see you. Hey. Good to see you two guys, hey, two, hey, two Philadelphia hey, guys. I, I just found out we both went to Temple University. I didn't know that. Yeah. No, I thought I, I told you that the last time. Well, I'm senile, so, you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what, when were you there? I went, uh, let's see, I graduated in 85, so like 83 to 85, journalism okay. department. Yeah. I was there from 73 to, no, 71 to 73, and then from 76 to 79 when I got my Ph.D. Fantastic. That's uh, the city's changed quite a lot. And I guess that's yeah. what we're here to talk about. Yeah, that's yeah. what I'd like to talk about. Yeah. So, OK, let's start there. And again, we may get into race or whatever, but I thought this was a more interesting conversation because we've seen, you know, the race debate a million times. And maybe we'll talk about it later. But um, I, I, I thought the um, dilapidation or degradation of Philadelphia itself, you both Philly guys, uh, was actually a, a more interesting topic, and, and you wrote a book on it, uh, EMJ. So, well, you know, about other cities too. But um, what what would you start off with here, EMJ? Uh, I would start, uh, the book is uh, The Slaughter of Cities, Urban Renewal is Ethnic Cleansing. I'm the first guy who said that. Uh, and I would start off with 1962 in Philadelphia. It was the turning point. Uh, 1962 is when uh, I, I, uh, when Jim Tate was elected mayor of Philadelphia. In July, of, July 4th, 1962, I went down to Independence Hall for the 4th of July celebration. And there on the, on the dais was the Catholic mayor of Philadelphia, Jim Tate, Catholic governor of Pennsylvania, and the Catholic president of the United States of America. And at this point, there was, a, there was a segment of the population that felt that the Catholics were taking over the country. Uh, the obvious sequel to that was 1963 when John F. Kennedy was assassinated. 
uh, which kind of started things heading in the, the opposite direction. But the insurrection in Philadelphia began in 1962. This is when Walt, Walter Phillips was the head of what we would call the WASP elite in Philadelphia. He uh, was a WASP who didn't live in either the, uh, the main line or Chestnut Hill. He lived on the Delaware River. He had a big estate in Tarsdale on the Delaware River, which was kind of anomalous. But he was the leader of the group that came to power uh, when uh, Joe Clark uh, and Richardson Dilworth came to power in the early, uh, right, I believe 1950, something around that time. And these are the people that believed in social engineering. They were all, they had all been in the war. They were, uh, I mean, Joe Clark never claimed he'd be a war hero. He played tennis in uh, India <laughs> for the entire duration of the war. Uh, but they came back, the WASP elite came back energized uh, and ready to take on the world because they believed in social engineering. This is the big turning point in American history. It happened in 1944 when Gunnar Myrdal wrote the book on race called An American Dilemma. He said, this is the era we're inaugurating. Everybody believes in science. We're inaugurating the era of social engineering where we're going to decide where you live. The man who carried that out in Philadelphia was John J. McCloy. John J. McCloy was the uh, high governor of Germany after the war. He was the Rockefellers uh, fix it, factotum. He did their bidding. Uh, and as head of the Ford Foundation after the war, he arranged for the ethnic cleansing of all of, of the Catholic neighborhoods in Philadelphia. He did this by hiring a guy by the name of Leon Sullivan. I don't know whether you remember Leon Sullivan. He was a black minister. Had uh, Black ministers were the leaders of the black community uh, in Philadelphia and elsewhere. Had a big uh, church there for all these people. He went down to North and South Carolina. He recruited black people with the, the blessing of the Ford Foundation, and Ford Foundation money, and he brought them up to Philadelphia and they engaged in the ethnic cleansing of the Catholic neighborhoods that took on a, a special force during the 1960s after Walter Phillips basically uh, declared war on the Catholics and Jim Tate. That's the story. I was part of this story. I lived in an Irish neighborhood North Philadelphia, St. Columbus, Paris. Uh, when the blacks crossed Lehigh Avenue, we left. We abandoned that Catholic neighborhood. We moved to, it was Northeast Philadelphia, but it was, uh, it was re really a suburb, even though it was technically within the, the bounds of uh, that. And at that point, you lost your ethnic identity. You were in school now with Polacks and Italians and God knows what, all, all these, the major, the major groups. Uh, and you became, uh, uh, to an extent, white because of your loss of identity. This happened across the country uh, in every major city in the North. The Catholic ethnics, the Poles were driven out of Chicago. They went to the suburbs where they became white. That was the, the big push of social engineering. And I'm saying that was the beginning of the destruction of Philadelphia. Now, what about you, Mr. Goad? Uh, what's your experience on this? Well, some of the founding documents of America mention the word white, so I think he's historically wrong about that. Uh, as far as uh, now, Kensington, especially, which is a, a neighborhood I'm fascinated with, I'm sure Dr. Jones is familiar with the Bible riots of 1844. These were white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, white English versus white Irish Catholics. If you took a skull of uh, one of these white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. Tell me, could you tell if they were Anglo-Saxon or Protestant? I think there's only one correct answer to that. You could tell that they were Anglo-Saxon. So I think religion has been used as a cover for what was actually an ethnic tribal, ethnic tribal uh, distinctions between uh, Irish and English. When I knew Kensington, it was, I, I grew up in the suburbs. I grew up in Delaware County and Clifton Heights. There were two ethnic groups there. Everyone was Catholic but there were Irish and Italians, and we split along those lines because there are ethnic differences that I think are based on genetics. I think genetics, I think E.O. Wilson is right, genetics are a factor, or culture is a factor of genetics. What, what is known as culture is ephemeral, but it's created by a specific genetic group in a specific time in a specific place. Culture can be thrown away. Genetics can't be dispensed uh, of that easily. 
I think that what destroyed it, and, and what I'm, I'm interested in what you uh, you said about them declaring war on Catholics. Did they do that in so many words? No. No? Okay. No, they would never admit that. This is, this is what one of the WASP told me when I was doing research for uh, the slaughter of cities. It would never, no one would ever admit that. So I, I got corroboration of this when a guy I knew um, has a, I don't want to mention his name, but it's a really WASP name. You can tell he's a WASP simply by his name. He went to Penn Charter, uh, which you know is like the WASP elite high school. Uh, and then he went to Yale and he took, he went to every single coming out party on the main line and uh, Chestnut Hill uh, during the fall of 1966. Okay. Then he became a Catholic. Now, nobody knew this. And so he's working for a big law firm. And basically, the head of the law firm takes him out to lunch. And he says, look, uh, we, had to, we had to step in and make sure that the Catholics didn't take over the city. And that's why we created Wilson Good, the first black mayor of Philadelphia. Oh, I'm, I'm familiar with Wilson Good. I lived like 19 blocks from where they dropped a bomb on the move yeah. compound in 85. Right. So, so if Frank Rizzo had dropped the bomb on a black neighborhood, uh, he would have been lynched. Uh, but... Uh, Wilson Good does it. He a uh, uh, totally incompetent. I'm saying that the the if if you got into a situation where they trusted you, uh, uh, they would say they would tell you this. The the the, the dynamic here, what well, obviously if you're using the blacks from South Carolina as your proxy warriors, obviously race plays a role in this. But the man behind it, if uh, John J. McCloy, uh, he's white. It was the white people at the Ford Foundation who waged war against the Catholics, and that's what destroyed the city. Now, one other thing I'd like to say is mo both my mother's family and my wife's family come from Kensington, more specifically Fishtown. And my wife's family was involved in that riot, the one you just mentioned. And it's called the Nativist Riot in 1844. Right. The, the, the windows on St. Peter and Paul Cathedral are real high. And the reason for that is they got an Irish guy, the strongest guy on the crew, to throw a brick as high as he could throw it. Uh, and that's where they put the windows because they didn't want a repeat of the nativist riots. Those nativist riots were about wages. Sure. The, I... Irish, the Irish immigrants were undercutting the wages of the skilled Protestant working class that was the backbone of, uh, of manufacturing power in Philadelphia, and they didn't like it, and they took it out by burning down the schools and convents. Would you agree with the premise that traditionally in America, immigration has been used, uh, not settling, not the original settlers, but immigration has been used to undercut wages across absolutely, the board? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. America is built on cheap labor. Right. That's the, uh, only re the only reason I'm an American is because of cheap labor. Sure. I mean, uh, and... How much have you delved in the history of indentured servitude and bond? I'm, as as a pro-Irish person, I, I would think you'd be on the side of, you, you're familiar with uh, Michael Hoffman, right? Yeah. And do you uh, find anything objectionable in what he's written about uh, white slavery, particularly? I'm not, I, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with what he's done on white slavery. Okay. I know, look, the term, the term white to describe human beings came into being at the beginning of the 17th century. There was a play in London where they used the word white to describe people. It reflected the situation in the tobacco plantations in Virginia, where you had Irish slaves, some people called them indentured servants, and you had African slaves. And in order to divide the working class so that they couldn't unite and get higher wages, they uh, used the term white to describe the Irish and black to describe the Africans. And it's been that way ever since. It's a category of the mind that gets used for political purposes uh, to divide people and uh, get them at each other's throats. So we're going to dip our toes into race here a little bit. Now, you say it's a category of the mind. Uh, the question that I had that went unanswered, I, ha, this is how I define white. It's somebody with predominantly European ancestry. A DNA test can, can determine that. Now, I think one, and one in my book, The Redneck Manifesto, I theorize that one of the reasons they switched from predominantly white indentured servitude, slavery, whatever you want to call it, because the, the majority of bound laborers in America from the early 1600s to 1750 were European. Uh, but one of the one of the problems is when they escaped, you couldn't tell the difference unless they had, you know, a, a throat iron on or leg irons. <laughs> One of the reasons was that you could tell a black was, you know, an escaped black, that was an escaped slave. So it was phenotypical. 
I understand there are economic differences. There are inch, you know, Irish first. I've always said that if there were identical twins were the only people left on the planet, they find a way to divide. I, I think that's part of human nature. That's the in group, out group, you know, the other. That's that's indisputable. But I think it's phenotypically, and this is I think last time I, I spoke with you was about five years ago, and it was on a stream hosted by Richard Spencer. You said that a friend of yours had been murdered in North Philly, an Irish Catholic friend, right? No, it was a student of my a wife. A student of, okay. My, not, my wife taught kindergarten in West Philadelphia uh, in the early 70s. Uh, West Philly is where my mom's part of the family. She was one of 11 Irish Catholics uh, in West Philly. So, and, the, uh, so they were ethnically cleansed. So I, to get back to the Irish kid, he, he, didn't, he didn't know he was white. He came over here. He thought he was Irish. He walks into uh, Southwest Philadelphia where there's gang warfare going on. They look at him, they think he's white, and they kill him. Right, but isn't, I, what I'm saying is I think it's a matter of proximity. I've said for a long time that the term the human race would only really have meaning if Martians invaded. You know, these are, these are almost like breeds of dogs or cats. They're, they're, they're going to split off, but, you know, if, if dogs come in, then, then it's a whole different war. Uh, and again, phenotypically, I, the thing that I said five years ago was that if your friend was murdered by blacks in West Philly, my bet would be that it's because they saw him as white and not as yeah, I'm, not, I'm not denying that. I <laughs> look, I I used to ride from Temple to Winfield, and the straightest route was over Diamond Street. And I thought, oh, you know, man. that's I a saw, bad bad turf there, Diamond Street. So yeah. so I thought, you know, on my bicycle. So I'm on my bicycle. Oh. And I'm thinking, <laughs> look, I'm 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 going to prove to you that I'm not a racist and. Uh, one day, they all the kids, uh, black kids, started throwing rocks at me. One hit me on the head, uh, and so I'm standing. The cop was right there. I go over to the cop, and I looked down. My my jacket is covered with blood now, and I said, uh, "Go." They're the people who did it. Go arrest me. And the cop said to me, "No, you're the one who's at fault. You have no business being in this neighborhood. So you don't have to tell me there's a difference between black and white. Okay, I understand that." You can tell, look at the people. I don't need a DNA test to say that someone's black and someone's white. I'm saying that that's not the grammar, the real grammar of what's going on here. The real grammar is the Ford Foundation, white guys at the Ford Foundation like John McCloy using the blacks from South Carolina as proxy warriors to drive out the Catholics. I, I think the major disagreement we're having here is that I think that they also used race as a proxy war. I don't think religion had much to do with it at all. But I think we're, we're on the same page as far as cheap labor and using different groups to divide people. I, I, I don't see any disagreement there, which is kind of surprising to me. I'm not sure if you've had a shift over the years or we've gradually. No, I, it's, I mean, it, it, it's, yeah. I've, al I've always, I mean, it's becoming clearer focus after, uh, over, over time. But I've I've always I've always felt this way, and if I had a time machine and I could go back uh, to that period of time, I'd like to go and I'd like to explain that to the blacks who were the proxy warriors and see if we can come to some type of common understanding of what's going on here. That still that still is not the case to this day, and I think that the zombies on Kensington Avenue are a symptom of the fact that we have repressed the real reason, the real history of what is going on in Philadelphia. Now, one th I'm glad you brought up Kensington Avenue because anybody watching this, just write down Kensington. That's all you need to search on YouTube and you will find literally thousands of videos of an inter a rainbow coalition of people nodding out their flesh rotting, not only from fentanyl, but from what's called trank, which is horse tranquilizer, where their, their bones are rotting away. I'm not sure if you're familiar with a book. I think it was published in 1970 called White Town, USA. It was about Kensington. No, I don't remember that. It was Harold Binzen, B-I-N-Z-E-N. I think in 1968, Kensington was like 98% white, or at least as I determined, you know, define it, predominantly European ancestry. The dividing line was Kensington Avenue, which turned into Frankfurt Avenue as it got closer to Center City. The buffer between the whites and the blacks in Philly, at least when I was driving a cab, putting myself through journalism school at Temple in the 80s, was what's known as the Philadelphia Badlands, which were the Puerto Rican neighborhoods. That was that was the main buffer from, you know, from uh, Kensington and Frankfurt all the way up to maybe 8th or 9th Street. And then you had just this mass of North Philly blacks. Um, the major thing that's changed over the years is, because Kensington, you were not allowed to cross uh, I guess it would be East 
yeah, east of Kensington Avenue at night. Those hard knuckled Kensington dudes would beat your ass if they didn't see you as one of them. That's all changed now. And due to, I think it's, again, we're on, it's surprising we're on the same page due to financial pressures. And one thing that has been mentioned yet is a globalization of the economy. One thing that happened to Kensington, you've got a lot of rotted out old factories. There's, there's no industrial base up there anymore. So everything, I mean, people despaired, they moved out, but the people who were stuck there, it's a, it, they integrated, Kensington is fully integrated now, but they're all on fentanyl and yeah. they, they leave hopeless lives of desperation. Right, right. Yeah, <laughs> uh, the, I, I think the man who's responsible for this is Dennis Clark. I, I talk about this in the uh, Slaughter of Cities. Dennis Clark was a devout Catholic in 1947 when he attended St. Joseph's College, which is where I, where I attended 20 years later. Uh, and uh, he became involved with the racial issue. Uh, in 1957, the uh, bishops, the Catholic bishops issued a statement in which they said, on race, in which they said, the Negro is a child of God. Well, who didn't think that? I mean, it was really <laughs> stupid. It was a total reaction to the civil rights movement. They were reacting to something that wasn't our fight at all. It was the South that had this problem with segregation. When Dorothy Tillman went to Chicago, uh, she said, down South, this is with Martin Luther King to disrupt the city, disrupt the city's ethnic neighborhoods. She said, down South, you was either black or white. You wasn't none of this Irish or Polish or none of that. Well, that's what you was in Philadelphia. You was Irish or you was Polish. And Kensington was mixed in that regard. It, you could call it white in a sense because my German grandmother used to go to a Polish butcher who think, addressed her as Pan Schenzler. So it was the, the, the melting pot was taking place here. But the melting pot is a triple melting pot after three generations in America, no matter where you come from, you are a Protestant, a Catholic, or a Jew, okay? And what Kennedy, about what about Muslims and atheists and this? This was this was formulated in the 1930s okay. when Muslims were completely insignificant. It's I a mean, so, I, sociological theory. I've popped so, into this world. I've seen you say before that the major ethnic conflicts in Philadelphia were Polish, Poles versus Irish. You know these tightly knit ethnic European derived communities. Do you think possibly, I, you were born in 48, I was born in 61. Do you think that the influx of blacks who were sent up to work the factory jobs to bust unions and wages, it changed the whole identity to where, you know, especially phenotypically, it's like, okay, we're not as Polish and Irish anymore as we are white because we've got this hot, this group right. that's trained to be hostile to us. Right. Okay. This is all right. mirac miraculous. Right. Well, all I'm saying, I'll give you an example like Chicago. I just mentioned Chicago. Martin Luther King showed up and he, he went to Marquette Park. Uh, and the people, the natives of Marquette Park threw rocks at him. One hit him on the head and, and uh, knocked him down. Okay. Now, what, as soon as the blacks showed up on one side of the street, the people on the other side of the street became white, obviously, because they're the opposite. But if you ask them, well, are you white? No, they would have said, no, we're Lithuanian. We came from Lithuania. So if you're saying that the arrival of the blacks changed the configuration in Philadelphia, I agree with you completely. It did change it completely. And I'm saying this is how they, this, this was part of social engineering. It's identity theft. You want to deprive the Catholics of their identity? They were intermarrying. My Irish grandfather had six children. Only one of them married another Irishman, but all of the children married Catholics. That's the way it was back then. And it was mixing up so that I'm biracial, I'm Irish and German. That was heading in that direction, but my identity became Catholic. This was disrupted by the social engineering that used blacks as proxy warriors. That disrupted and the whole, the whole uh, uh, ecology of the ethnic neighborhood throughout America, not just in, in Philadelphia. And you're saying the primary motivation wasn't religious animus, it was economic. No, I'm saying it was religious animus. I mean, more, could, more than economics. Well, I mean, look, if you're talking about 1844 and the nativist riots, that was not religious primarily. That was economic primarily. If you're talking I think, about, I think it was both back then because there, there was some dispute over like okay. teaching te rumors about not being able to teach the Bible in in public schools or something. Yeah, yeah. If you're if you're talking about the period following World War II, the the anti-Catholic animus was specific and obvious. And I'm referring to a book 
uh, by Paul Blanchard called American Freedom and Catholic Power. This was a series of articles that came out in The Nation in 1947, came out as a book in 1949. That book was basically saying that the, the Catholics are taking over the country. This will be the end of our freedom. The WASP ruling class greeted that with hallelujahs. I, I'm talking about people like uh, Perry Miller. I mean, the great uh, 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 chronicler of Puritan life in America. I mean, a, a man of real stature in the intellectual world. Thought this was the greatest book and it had to be said. It was overtly anti-Catholic at that time. And this was manifested in Philadelphia and, and places like uh, Chestnut Hill and the Wasp elite there. Now the word Catholic essentially means universal, inclusive. Would you deny that over at least the past hundred years, the Catholic church has been a primary pusher and mover of, of global immigration, and that currently it's supporting millions of Catholic mestizos, Mesoamericans coming from south of the border. I know there was, I mentioned, I wrote last week, there's a minor scandal in Italy about certain Catholic bishops conspiring with right. human traffickers who are bringing Africans into Italy. So, I mean, it seems, it seems like you've kind of, you've become disaffected at least with the modern uh, Catholic church or the, the hierarchy of the Catholic church. When do you think it went wrong? Um, May, of, Vatican, May of 1965. Vatican II? No, it's the Jews. It's uh, if, you, if, you think, <laughs> if you think the Catholics are behind immigration, I have to refer you to Barbara Lerner Specter. These I'm, are the people. I'm, a, I'm aware of those people. Why, these, why, these why can't it be people, both? Uh, these are the people. The Catholics are in a position, the Catholic bishops are in a position where people who show up at their doorstep and who are in need and they provide help to these people. Now, if that, ena if that enables mass migration, uh, I, I, can see, I can see your point. But, but, the people, but the people, if you want to know where th what happened uh, in 1965, it was a momentous year where the wheels came off in, in many different respects. Number one, uh, the Jews in Hollywood broke the production code in 1965 with a Holocaust porn film called The Pawn Broker. The Catholics had controlled Hollywood up to that point, and they found themselves helpless to deal with the whole idea of the Holocaust and what uh, was essentially a manipulation of uh, government propaganda uh, for, uh, as the basis of Jewish power. They, they were in this problem because the the other thing that happened in 65 was that the Vatican Council passed something called Nostra Aetate, which was supposed to be address the Catholic relationship to the Jews. In that, that was, uh, the Jews tried to subvert that. It's in my book, uh, The Jewish Revolutionary Spirit. Malachi Martin was a double agent working for the Jews, a Jesuit working for the Jews. But uh, anyway, the statement in that uh, document is, the church opposes all forms of anti-Semitism. Well, wait a minute. You can't say that. What's the Latin word for anti-Semitism? There is no Latin word. It was created in 1871. You can't put a term like that into a church document without defining it. So because if you that, don't, if you don't, basically the ADL is now, which is the state now. I, I I'm prime example. Of it. The ADL now determines whether I'm a Catholic in good standing or not. That's interesting. But you're so you're saying that at some point the Catholic Church was infiltrated by Jewish money, Jewish ideology. No, I didn't say that. Okay. It did, and how it, were they able to? Well, to first, first of all, if, the if, Catholic Church? if you're talking about the document Nostra Aetate, uh, Malachi Martin failed. It's in the, uh, I have all the documentation, all the Jews who were paying him money because they wanted the church to say that the Jews uh, did not kill Christ. You're never going to get 2000 bishops together who are going to say that not going to happen and it didn't happen so it wasn't the document wasn't subverted it has this achilles heel because they didn't define one of their terms what happened after that is that the jews took over the interpretation of the document and turned it into basically a war against the catholic church that the catholic uh what should i say hierarchy uh never understood never i i he had Cardinal Kroll's biography. You remember Cardinal Kroll. John Cardinal Kroll, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I did the biography of Cardinal Kroll, and it was clear that they had no, he had no idea of what psychological warfare was. He had no idea that the WASP elite was manipulating racial migration to destroy parishes, like probably the one your mother came from, which was Most Blessed Sacrament Parish in southwest Philadelphia. I know they used to go to St. Barnabas. 
Okay. All right. Maybe right. not. Anyway, that parish, that was the biggest Catholic, that was the biggest parish. It was the, had the biggest Catholic grade school in the world. 3,000 students. Cardinal Doherty was the biggest Catholic high school in the world, 5,000 students. And over the period of 1966 to 1976, the entire uh, parish was ethnically cleansed. And the Irish were driven out into Delaware County, and they never recovered. The church has never recovered. This is the social and moral fabric of Philadelphia. When you destroy that, don't be surprised when the zombies show up on Kensington Avenue. I'm curious, when you go to a restaurant, you go, I'll have the omelet. Or, I mean, you, you're always yelling. <laughs> Are you aware of this? Jim, you bring out the best in me. <laughs> Okay. But I mean, so I'll clear something up, though. You, it sounds like from what you're saying that Protestants and Jews successfully either like uh, strong armed Catholics, that, but you're saying they didn't infiltrate them. Can you clear up the difference for me? Yeah, the Catholic Jew, uh, the Protestant Jewish Alliance in Philadelphia was known as Americans for Democratic Action. That was the base uh, that they used there. Um, if you say they they in, did they infiltrate the church? Of course they infiltrated the church. I just got I began by talking to you about all those Catholic girls that went to high school in the suburbs where I near LaSalle High School and how the nuns became feminists and the girls became sexual revolutionaries and then they uh, uh, had abortions and once these ladies become abor have abortion they become Jews. They all became Jews. I became a Jew during this period of time. Uh, but how do I know they're Jews? Because they vote like Jews, and that's called feminism, and that's why we have a Jewish governor of Pennsylvania. So you think you can stop becoming a Jew? Like any Jew could stop becoming a Jew? Or, Absolutely. Absolutely. Or, so someone with Ashkenazim DNA, even... So how are there Jewish atheists, then? Is that a let, let, me, let, let me cut to the chase here. This is a, a crucial issue. There was a guy in Poland, a Jew, uh, during World War II, he was uh, working for the SS, but he was really a double agent. They found out about him, so he went into hiding in a Carmelite convent. He then became a Catholic. And then after, he, he then became a priest, and then after the founding of the State of Israel, he went to Israel and said, I want citizenship, and they denied him citizenship. Now, why did they deny him citizenship? Did his DNA change when, that wa when the water of baptism ran across his forehead? I'm under the impression, and I could be wrong about this, that more recently, the right of return, some of it has, uh, you can establish uh, being Jewish with DNA, with Ashkenazic heritage. But, Don't quote me but, on that. But you cannot become a citizen. You are no longer a Jew if you get baptized. This proves that this is not about DNA. This is about religion. This is a theological conflict that took place when the Messiah showed up in Jerusalem and the Jews, some of the Jews converted, accepted him as the Messiah, and the other Jews rejected him. And those Jews who rejected him became revolutionaries, and that's what they are to this day. So you're saying there are no atheists living as Israeli citizens? Absolutely. Sure there are. You can be an atheist and it won't disqualify you from being a Jew, but you cannot get baptized. Baptizing. That will disqualify you. What did, did Ethan said something? Hi, hey, Ethan. <laughs> no, I was just going to say, I, yeah, I don't know the the full facts, but, uh, you know, I, I, I trust him. Like, if you get baptized as a Christian or Catholic or something like that, that totally negates your your Jewish heritage, DNA heritage. Is that what you're saying? I'm saying it's not about DNA. That's a lie. The Jew will never be honest with you about what his identity, and you have to basically impose the, his identity on him, which is rejection of logos, because the DNA thing is a myth. They use it, obviously they use it. They use it to, you know, if, if Rus, uh, Oswald Rufeisen had not become, if he had not become a, a, a Christian, then the DNA was still in force. The DNA rule is still in force. But if you become a Christian, the DNA rule goes out the window, which proves that it's phony. It's a phony designation. And you are aware, I'm sure, that the term logos, logos, uh, it, it originated it uh, with the ancient Greeks. Who was, Absolutely. What, were, what were the ancient Greeks like BC before Christ? What would they be ethnically to you? Greeks. Just Greeks. They, they, well, they all spoke Greek. <laughs> they, the, main, the main ethnic designator is language. And so they were Greeks. 
Heraclitus is an, an example, uh, a man who really understood, uh, basically, basically launched the word logos uh, among the pre-Socratics. Basically broke away from the materialist understanding of some like like Thales who thought ultimate Thales who thought ultimate reality was a was water or some material thing. Heraclitus lives in lived in Ephesus, which is in Turkey or at Persia. It was at Persia at that point. So the only he was an eth ethnic because of the language he spoke. Nobody knew about DNA at that point. It didn't exist at that point, or it did. Oh, but it I mean, nobody knew what it was. But right, determining it couldn't. Okay. Right. Yeah. So he, he, his ethnicity was determined by his language. But I mean, the term logos or logos is also related to logic, because it's my understanding that back then people started realizing, well, two plus two always equals four, et cetera, et cetera. And they noticed that there was some kind of order to the universe. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. That's, that's the, the, my book, Logos Rising, talks about the, exactly that, the emergence of this concept, the emergence of the idea that there is a unifying factor to the universe and it's not material it's spiritual it's logos and the man who took it forward was saint john uh, who blended the hebrew scriptures and greek philosophy at the beginning of his gospel when he said yeah, I was gonna say, chapter of one chapter one first verse of john right in the beginning there was logos what's the word right yeah, but I can't use the word word because it doesn't, nobody understands it then. In the beginning, there was Logos. Logos was with God and Logos is God. Logos is God. Now that's profound. Okay. <laughs> I, th I think the, the fundamental difference here, I, I think uh, my point is that race is something that can be quantified, whether or not somebody was, was a follower of you know, the Torah or the New Testament. You, you couldn't tell that from a skull. I think that, but otherwise, yeah, I'm totally in line with America was founded on cheap labor and that immigration has been traditionally used to, to cheapen wages. But I think a huge problem right now is that's where a lot of the Im illegal immigration, I think 50% of immigrants to America at this point are Catholic and most of them are from south of the border and yeah. are, are racially different than the European settlers of the United States. Yeah. So first of all, I am not a proponent of weaponized mass immigration at all. Okay. Uh, not here, uh, not in Ireland, uh, not in Europe, not at all, because it's always a weapon to destroy your culture. I'm currently trying to add a chapter to my book, The Holocaust Narrative, about the massive displacement of ethnic Germans during uh at the after the oh yeah world war ii yeah that's, that something, was, that's something you might want to check michael hoffman with he's in kirtle lane, lane idaho i think he's still a catholic and uh breeding I, I think he's at 60s 70s and i think still breeding but uh he's done a lot of work on judaism and it's probably worth your while to check out what he said about it and he's uh yeah he did a book that's like 2,000 pages called judaism strange gods that's all yeah. deep into the talmud and everything else Right. Yes. And I think that's so it happened. Everyone agreed uh, that ethnic cleansing was doable and that you could have positive outcomes from it. And now we have the, the heir of this ha, is Benjamin Netanyahu, who is proposing exact for Gaza exactly what the allies did to the ethnic Germans uh, after World War II. Or what the English did with Ireland by sending Scots, Ulster Scots. Down absolutely. Down. Absolutely. Yeah. It's an old story. It's an old story. Uh, so I think that's exactly what's happening. The only uh, uh, everyone else thinks it's reprehensible. But now Netanyahu is trying to justify Gaza by appealing to what the Americans did in World War II. Has he tried appealing to what the Americans did to the uh, the indigenous Americans? Or is no, he, don't, he doesn't want to talk about that because that mm -hmm. would bring up the fact that the Palestinians are the indigenous population right. uh, in, in Palestine. Ethan's just word. Oh, is Ethan still there? Yeah, there he is. Yeah, I'm still here. I just let you guys <laughs> let you guys carry on. Uh, I I did have a super chat. Now it's a little bit off topic, so I I didn't really want to interrupt, but uh, you know it does have to do with Philadelphia, and they said um, uh, best cheesesteak uh, in Philadelphia. I believe these are cheesesteak places. Uh, Pat's or Geno's? I think this is the first question I asked 
Yeah, you broke. You broke. Everybody cracked up when you asked this. With, um, Richard Spencer. Richard Spencer didn't have a clue what you were talking. What about. the hell I was talking about? <laughs> Pat's and Geno's, and I think it's on Ellsworth or Federal and about Eighth Street in South Philly. It's right near the Italian Market where Sylvester Stallone ran through like all the you yeah. Know, the yeah. Fish. Uh, they're twenty-four hours. They're open. They're they've got yellow neon neon signs keeping them lit. Day and night. Pat's is on one end, well, Caddy Corner, as they used to say, and Gino's is on the other. I like Gino's not only because they have the hottest hot sauce I've ever had in my life, but the guy Joey Vento, mm -hmm. who died about eight nine years ago, he had he had all it, the windows of Gino's was were plastered with all this anti mumia Abu Jamal, and this is America speak English. Pat's was apolitical, but like Joey Vento and Gino Steaks, not only I think the steaks were, they tasted better, but uh, he was hilariously brash and bold. And, and you also mentioned uh, Frank Rizzo, my favorite politician of all time, despite being Italian. Yes, uh, I don't have any preference. I ate numerous cheesesteaks and very rarely uh, on, on uh, 9th Street hardly went uh, down to 9th Street. It was always kind of like on the other side of the uh, the dark side of the moon. No, I, that's not true. <laughs> Delaware County was the dark side of the moon. I never <laughs> in Delaware County at all. Yeah. But, uh, you know, uh, ashakun sagut, uh, de gustibus non disputandum est. Ashakun sagut is to each their own, right? Yeah. Okay. More super chats, Ethan? Yeah, no, well, if they want to send them in, send them in. Um, so uh, it seems like there's there's agreement, but obviously some disagreement on on certain things. Um, uh, well, so one thing I think that's important, and we seem to be on the same page on, and this is something I've noticed, and I don't think it's accidental or coincidental. I've noticed over the past dozen years or so, no one talks about economics anymore. It's all as you know, EMJ's magazine, Culture Wars. It's all about degeneracy or you know and racism. Right. right. No one and but I think that's I think that's been engineered because the, the entire country has been sold out from under our feet. Absolutely you're absolutely right. You're yeah. absolutely right. I'm just covering this part now in, in Germany. Uh, uh, this period of time, the late sixties is called the Dezechtwelle, the sex wave. And the data, the German, they, this is when they still had the German Democratic Republic on the other side. And they came back and said, the, the, the sex wave was created to distract the West Germans from their uh, high unemployment rate. And I thought, this guy nailed it on the head. That's exactly what this was about. And if you want a proof of it, there's a movie that inaugurated the, the sex, the whole use of pornography as a form of control, which is another book I wrote called Libido Dominandi, okay? Uh, go, it's it's a, a, a book called, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a book first, Las Jochen Kumpel. Las Jochen, uh, you know, let the good times roll. It's let, let it itch, I don't know, it, you can't translate. It's Ruhrgebiet slang. But it was about the workers in the uh, coal mines in the Ruhrgebiet and the beginning of it, is basically the guy's walking toward the the, the shift, you know, the coal mine, and he's thinking, "This is my life. My this is a miserable life. I think I'm going to go to the day day air where they treat workers uh, properly." He walks into the knipe, he orders a drink, and that guy takes him to a whorehouse. That is the whole story of the decline of the West in a nutshell. The man who brought it about, I think, primarily was Michel Foucault, a homosexual. It switched at that period of time. We're talking about the late 60s, 68, uh, when suddenly uh, being left meant sex, and it didn't mean economics anymore. And yeah, sex, was, sex was created to distract you from the fact that you got shitty wages and you can't ask for a raise anymore. I'm not, I'd say like uh, things more than sex, like race and and gender you know man versus man versus women rich for rich versus poor completely evaporated from the entire national discussion i like again i think that was entirely deliberate and it, it fascinated me because 10 years ago 12 years ago you had the occupy wall street people you had the tea party people complaining about taxes that's gone it's that's all right. all culture I, stuff now i went i went to uh, what at uh, that park in in manhattan uh, uh, and I saw these guys standing there, the guys, young guys in their 20s, they're all holding little signs and they're saying, I have 
I'm $55,000 in debt because of student loans, and all I can get is an unpaid internship. And that was completely ignored by Fox News, who was saying that there were sexual degenerates and they're shitting on the sidewalk. Completely, they completely ignored, that's supposedly the conservative uh, station, they completely ignored that whole economic angle of these, these poor people uh, who are in their 20s who are burdened with debt. Yeah, it's fascinating. So we agree, too, that the, the discussion has been completely shunted away from economics. Jim, we agree on everything. I, except, well, <laughs> you, you, keep, you, keep, you keep looking for a, a reason to disagree with me. I keep looking no, I'm for a reason. I'm, I'm telling you what I, what I agree with, and I, I, but I would focus more on genetics. And I, I, religion is just something... I mean, I, again, I was raised Catholic. I, I and someone sent me a link. I didn't watch it. That you were talking. You mentioned me a couple of weeks ago that I chose a dark path away from Catholicism. If it makes you happy, more power to you. I think my observations Gaddy over the past six or seven dollars. years is that's ENJ been used as another Blackers. distraction away from what's pass? going on economically. Well, I said once that uh, a white boy is a Protestant who doesn't go to church anymore. And I have to have a corollary now. In your case, it's a Catholic boy who doesn't go to church anymore. <laughs> well, I, 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 speaking of which, you said you were uh, you were tooling your bicycle through what, like Diamond Street in North. Down Diamond Street, yeah. And got rocks thrown at you. I had a. Yeah. I, I was uh, held up at gunpoint at 13th and Arch near the Greyhound station. I would have been like 16, 17. If the guy took my seven dollars. I had to walk all the way out to Delaware County. So going through West Philly, I, a couple times. Hey, white boy. Got, that got screamed at. I don't think they know anything about my religion. So that's play, that's play that funky music, white boy. <laughs> right. <laughs> they they recognized they knew, knew course, nothing about me. Of, they saw my skin. Well, what you should do is wear a big scapular. You know, dress, dress up like a Franciscan monk and wear a big scapular, and then people will know you're not white. <laughs> right, right. They they wouldn't call me white boy. They'd that's say, right. hey, hey, you Catholic. Yeah. Right. <laughs> So, uh, uh, and I have another uh, super chat question here in a sec, but um, so I guess, and, and I've seen you catching a lot of heat. Of course, MJ is super well respected, uh, but there was some stuff going on in Ireland, and um, you had talked about, well, this is basically what they want, right? Um, the the right. Irish to separate uh, as 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 race, so they're more easily divided. I, I'm, I'm su summarizing what you said. No, but go I'll, ahead. I'll get, yeah. I'll give you the classic example. Leo Varadkar, who is a, a, uh, a queer, who's an Indian, uh, announces in front of the, the uh, Dale that uh, there are too many white people in Ireland. Yeah, I now, think wait, all, all the national leaders in the wait, United wait Kingdom a minute. are, are non-European. So I said, I said, wait a minute, there are no white people in Ireland. And this, of course, gets me uh, all uh, people get all the white boys got their knickers in a twist when I said that. And I said, look, uh, then they have this riot. OK, somebody says that uh, some girls got stabbed. Then there's a riot and then they're burning buses in Dublin and stuff like that. Now, uh, my friend, I've done numerous podcasts with Gemma O'Doherty about the situation in Ireland. I respect her opinion. She said this is a false flag. I think she was absolutely right, because immediately after that, uh, Veradikar says, well, we need hate speech or crimes legislation because of the riot. Well, you probably started the riot, Leo, you know? So what I'm saying to my Irish friends, I'm, I'm half Irish, you know what I mean? So maybe I'm half right here in this regard, <laughs> but I'm saying to my Irish friends, you're not white. And if you identify as white, you fall into the trap that they're preparing for you. Because if you're white, you're bad. And if you're bad, you're a racist and you're bad. And if you're bad, well, they can do anything they want to you. So, now, you, if think, if, so you think if they just these Muslim uh, East Asian types, if they stop calling them white before they stab them and just realize, oh, you're you're Irish, they wouldn't stab them. I think that's preposterous. I've, I've, I've I, feel, already, I, I just did an article about I've, uh, I've stabbings already, in France. And in almost every case, they didn't say you Christian, you infidel. They said white. I don't think it's an invented term. I think, like I said, it's a matter of proximity. Once, once you broaden the scope and you have people from different continents coming in, national differences like Irish and English kind of dissolve, and it's more of just phenotypically. They can tell you were descended in Europe. 
That's that's the catch. I don't think white is an imaginary. How I define race is continental ancestry. If you want to get into you know national origin, then you, then you're breaking it down a little more. But I think yeah, I think the old I don't know if it was Will Durant, whoever, but Europeans are white, Africans are black, uh, and Asian or Mesoamerican. I think those are those are helpful. And that's in, in a street fight. That's what people are going to see. They're not going to see things that you can change. You can't change your your genetics. You can't. I guess you can go and get plastic surgery and change your skin color, but nobody's nobody's going to be attacking you for being Irish. They're going to see you as white. Uh, tell that to Cromwell. Well, he's yeah, but this is when there were no black people in Ireland. Oh, oh wait a minute! This is there when there was, were no Muslims. What in about Ireland. that conflict? How, what's the racial interpretation of Cromwell? Well, Cromwell was Anglo-Saxon, and the people who no, went. No, 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 the people, no, let me no, finish. No, let me no, finish. No. I can yell too. One at a time. People, the people, the people oh. that he went over, and he, he vowed to. Uh, he said it was every Catholic man, woman, and child in Ireland. And as far as I know, what was it, Drogheda? I'm not sure how you pronounce that. Drogheda. Right, there were slaughters, and right. one estimate I saw, he left with his new model army eight, nine months later, and it, from what I saw, and this sounds like overwhelming, but they had killed like 80% of the native inhabitants of Ireland. But as I said earlier, I think Protestant and Catholic, these were just covers for more, for deeper blood differences between Celts and Anglo-Saxons. Look, uh, you can, I'm, I, I know you think that, I think it's crazy, uh, <laughs> but, uh, We'll just have to agree. I mean, if, yeah. if you if you had remained in the Catholic Church, you're probably be saying things that were much more intelligent than what you're saying right now. <laughs> but that's you know that's what happens when you leave the Catholic Church. But this was a, so. Let's get this straight. Cromwell was a Protestant. The Irish are Catholic. That was the armature. That was the grammar of that conflict. Now I'll get more specific. Cromwell was a Puritan. Puritans are Judaizers. These are people who think they're Jews. And when because they think they're Jews, they can act like Jews. And the one thing they can do is declare anybody they don't like Amalek. And so Judaism, the Judaizing influence of the Puritans, made them completely ignore any type of moral law. And that's why they slaughtered the Irish. It, so had, you think it, had, it had nothing to do with race, nothing. So you think in Old Testament times, a Hebrew could just suddenly become an Amalekite by changing his ideology, by changing what he believed in his mind, the category in his mind that he changed? Yes, this is known as idolatry. The, 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 the feet of the Hebrews weren't dry yet from crossing the Red Sea when they started worshiping Moloch. That's exactly what they did. This was the fundamental temptation of every Hebrew to become uh, another religion by worshiping the God, uh, Mo, uh, Moloch and offering up your child to and him. Suddenly, suddenly, miraculously, their genetic configuration was changed. No, it, does, it wasn't changed at all. This shows the bankruptcy of this Jewish racial thinking. It's, so you're disagreeing it's, with the idea that culture is a factor of genetics. It's a specific genetic group's response to their environment at a specific time. Jim, that he's E.O. Wilson would have said. I keep trying to help you, Jim. I'm, I'm, going, to, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to create a a twelve step program for lapsed Catholics who think they're white boys, and you'll be the first one to be invited to join this program. Now, you know what? Okay, let me ask this because it's been brought up a couple times already. Jim, you said you were raised a Catholic. You don't have to answer if you don't want. Why no. did you stop identifying as a Catholic? Okay, well, I was raised Catholic. I went to 12 years of Catholic school. Uh, I did too, was, by the way, eight years, okay. even though I was a Baptist. Yeah, but yeah, I go went, ahead. Okay, so when you're raised in it, and the Catholics, as everyone knows, don't focus too much on the Bible, but it was just you're raised believing these things. You believe there's a heaven and a hell. And I, I remember, God, I went the first, uh, I went to, I got in trouble at my working class Catholic school. They sent me to a private school, figuring that I was too smart for the kids in the working class school. And I remember a teacher said that uh, Christmas was Jesus's birthday and me and another kid started singing happy birthday. Teacher grabbed us by the hair back when I had hair, yanked me out of the classroom and said, we're going to hell. We're going to, to me, that's child abuse. But anyway, growing up with this framework, cause you did, they didn't press a lot of, you know, they weren't extremist about it. As long as you went to church and you, you know, paid, you put your little money in the envelope every week, that was fine. But freshman year of high school, the nun and she, like we would call them the chin strappers. The really old nuns would have a chin to keep their, their yeah, waddles keep from falling the down to thing. their knees. Right. Yeah, yeah. 
she started talking about the visions of Our Lady of Fatima, who was this like Zeppelin-sized Virgin Mary who allegedly appeared to shepherd children in Portugal. And the Virgin Mary in these, in these test, you know, transcribed testimonies, she was staring down into hell and it was terror, mm -hmm. terrifying. I'm like, holy shit, that is scary. So it was Easter when I Easter sun Easter weekend when I was a freshman in, in Catholic high school. I started reading the Bible. And I'm like, holy hell, like you have to pretty much be an extremist. You have there are there are uh, verses about having to abandon your, you know, if, if anyone follows me and does not hate his mother and father, love not the things of the world. Any man loves the, the world. Yeah. So I became, I took it literally. I became a fanatic. Even the nuns thought I took it too far. But after a while, I've, I've said this many times, I've only had three philosophical transformations in my life. First was when I figured out there was no Santa Claus. And I'm still pissed off about that. The second, I read the Bible closely enough, and there were things that, from the Old and New Testament, within the New Testament, I just couldn't reconcile. And then I realized that the Bible has been written by, what, three, four dozen author, authors over a thousand years. It is the most contradiction-riddled book I've ever read in my life. And I couldn't be honest with myself anymore that it was true. The third philosophical revelation I had was about 30 when I'm like, oh, this, all this shit I've been fed about equality is obviously a lie. Obviously a lie. Blacks are dumber. The Vietnamese that I, I researched when I was doing an article for Playboy about Vietnamese gangs in Orange County, those, those guys, they came over on, you know, rafts made of popsicle sticks and had mansions and Maseratis by the time they were 22. I started believing in most all of the research I've seen backs it up that people who grew up under different evolutionary selection pressures develop different aptitudes based on their environment. Some environments favored intelligence, some, some favored brute strength. So that's it. I, I mean, I, to me, Christian, I think with Christianity, it's enduring legacy is people don't know what the hell to do with their guilt. And Christianity is like, oh, it's, it's taken care of. Debt's paid. Okay. Now go ahead, so, MJ. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for lying down on the psychiatrist's couch. So <laughs> doc, Dr. Dr. Jones will now take over from here. <laughs> and I, these are known as Sigmund Freud called them screen memories. Okay. They are there to distract us from something that you don't want to talk about, but you do want to talk about. And I'm talking about your sex life. Let's talk about your sex life, Jim, and how that. Yeah, I knew you were the most. Cop, Let's not the talk most about cop, mine, but go ahead. Of, yeah. You're the most. <laughs> Freddie Mercury doesn't think about gay sex as much as you do, pal. You want to talk about the 80 women I've been with, my gorgeous current wife, the three wives? I don't talk about gay sex. Do you think ever, that? Really. Do you ever. think that? I'm not. I'm not uh, in, uh, implying that you're a homosexual at all. I'm just saying. Do you think your sex life had something to do with the fact that you're no longer a Catholic? Nothing at all to do with it. No. I was okay. I was so. I was such. This is how how committed I was. I, I I like got intense about religion at like age 14 and nine months, and then just you know fell away from it because I couldn't reconcile what I saw as the million contradictions about 16 and a half that entire time and that's primo when your hormones are just surging i jerked off once i was a catholic like i said the nun sex had nothing to do with it it had to do with maybe i'm autistic and maybe autistic is just a slur word for people who put logic over emotions and social approval there's no way that the bible as it's written there's no way it's true that was it okay I if can't, you want to gaslight me and say what my real motivations I th are fine. I think, there's no I th use in arguing over that i think i think it is your real motivation but uh, <laughs> okay you know i think that, that's uh, one of those things motivations is something I think, you really can't argue about i know i can't i yeah. can't go any farther than that other than right, proposing right. it uh but i will also i will say that lust darkens the mind i think that's true i think that you're a victim of the what i described in uh, libido dominandi the sexual social engineering of the entire catholic church in america uh you're part of that collateral damage that took place because when you it was two parts you know breaking up the catholic neighborhoods disrupted the transmission of the faith and then the double whammy is the sexual revolution which basically got people so self-involved uh, that they couldn't see uh, straight anymore uh, and uh, they ended up being completely well, the, deracinated, cut the, off, cut off from their roots. The Catholic high school I went to was Cardinal O'Hara in Broomall, Pennsylvania. I'm sure you're familiar with the Catholic charismatic renewal. I'm not sure if they even have that anymore. This was a big thing in the 70s where they play guitars and they act right, like I'm very familiar with it. And they they were Pentecostals. They spoke in tongues, et cetera, et cetera. 
the guy who ran that place was Father Richard Jones, and he was always very chummy with people. He would hug you like a little, right. too, little too long. He he gave the sermon at my father's funeral when my dad died. I, I wasn't even aware that Father Jones knew my dad. And we're sitting there. My mom at that point had lost her hearing. She smiled the whole way through. But my brother and sister are listening there for 15 minutes about what a bastard my father was. And we were shocked. It's like, like you know, whether or not he was a bastard, not the appropriate time. Huh. Father Richard Jones, now I've estimated because uh, it was a Catholic school of about 4,000 people when I you know, the lay teachers versus the, you know, there were nuns and priests teaching there. I'd estimate there were about 20 priests maximum teaching there. Maybe it was 30, definitely not more than 30. To my knowledge, six of them came up on molestation charges. Five of them were defrocked because the Catholic Church itself found these allegations to be credible. Father Jones was one of them. Another one was Father uh, Francis Gilliberti, who had a masturbation camp for boys down at Cape May, New Jersey. He'd teach boys not to masturbate by playing with their penises. The only the one of the six the only one of the six priests who wasn't formally defrocked was uh, I forget his first name Father Close C L O S E. They found the allegations credible, but the statute of limitations had expired. As far as warping people sexually, I think forcing someone to be celibate and when they go into the seminary, which is ironically the seminary in their late teens at the height of their sex drive i think you're only attracting sexually warped people to begin with so we're definitely going to disagree about all that yeah well this brings us back to where we started which is with michael voris uh and uh you oh, see he's, he's, i know a little bit about him and like when i first came on and i was in the background i could hear you, you talk. Heard, yeah. he, he's, he's an odd duck absolutely no i agree i wrote a book about him and i agree with a that whole book he, about michael voris well I'll i did okay yes yeah, it's, it's called you can get it at fidelity press it's called the man behind the curtain and it's about uh, homosexual narcissism and the, the whole thing but i'm saying that people it could be the, the man in the closet maybe but anyway go ahead <laughs> behind the curtain works too sorry go ahead go ahead <laughs> go ahead doctor anyway this is the type of uh motivation that people had it's the same thing that you're talking about you, you, they needed these scandals in the Catholic Church to make them good feel feel good about themselves, and to help them to forget their own problems and their own shortcomings and their own sins. But I, but I didn't know about any of this when I lost the faith. It was from reading the Bible, and I mean, the nuns had been violent to me in grade school. That was part of it, and I, that's when I learned to associate people who are overly moralistic. They're just using that to vent their own, you know, sexual sad, sadism more or less the people who really have to thump their chest about morality in my experience have been the some of the meanest and most warped bastards mm -hmm. the people i consider truly good are so secure they never have to talk about being good and they never have to point fingers about how wretched and degenerate and fucked up everybody well, you, else is. you just did that though you just did that with all those priests no i was i was just saying you, you brought up sex and catholics so I, I said well this is what happened at my high school but this i only found out about these sexual scandals long after i had abandoned the faith yeah, but they're convenient now because they justify yeah. your rebellion against Catholic just, sexual I just, morality. I, I just don't be believe in it. That's all. It's not okay. like, I was like, I don't need anything. It's logic, logos, the original Greek version. That that's I think it's an illogical religion. That, that God gets pissed off all the time. It's like, dude, you created the universe. It's like it's like decorating your apartment and then thrashing it because you're pissed off at the way it looks. None of it makes any sense. But if you want to say they're a deep rooted cycle, that's I'm sure that's convenient for you because maybe it's terrifying for you to think, hey, maybe it is illogical. So you have to go, you know, you have to attack the you know, ad hominem and it's, well, it's your deep root, you know, but it just doesn't make any sense. No one, especially by insulting me, has been able to, to persuade me I'm to not, come I'm back not, to the faith. I'm not, I'm not trying to insult you. I'm not well, trying to insult you. I'm trying to get to the root. You're, you're going of, for motive. The root, well, but one you, time. You, can't, you can't seem to accept the I'm, idea that I'm trying, it, it, I I'm, found it illogical and that was the root of it. I'm trying to help you. I'm not trying to insult you. I think, you know, I think if you sent a Martian down and says, who seems actually less grumpy and more well-adjusted? I don't think they'd pick you, BMJ. I, I agree with you completely. I agree with you completely. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you know what? Uh, I have a super chat. I was only going to keep you guys for an hour anyway because I, I know Jim's got some stuff going on. Thank you yeah, both yeah. for allowing me to move around the time because I really wanted to get this in. I think it's been yeah. very, uh, very yeah. entertaining uh, to say the least. Uh, I see Gaddius says, what is emj think of jerry Bla uh blavatz jerry blavitt hey jerry blavitt. Blavitz. The, heater. The, heater. the heater with the heater yeah, yeah. I used all to right go to wagner yeah wagner ballroom 
you Did probably you went to Shavu. No, you, you went to Shavu because you lived on the dark side of the moon. Shavu was before my time, but I love Jerry Blavitt. I memorialized him when he died last year. Uh, encyclopedic knowledge of early rock and roll. Probably the best rock and roll DJ who ever lived. Uh, yeah. yeah. Jerry, but, and he, he was half Jewish and half Italian, right? And mom right. up too. Yeah. He, uh, he, <laughs> he allegedly tried to put a hit on High Lit, who was the other big DJ <laughs> in Philadelphia. I don't know if you know about I that. I thought it was like, Dick Clark. I thought it was, no, it was Dick just, Clark. It may be Dick Clark, too, but it was documented. <laughs> you can find Jer Jerry Blavitt, B-L-A-V-A-T, and High Lit, which is a really cool name. Joe, Joe Niagara was another big Hyman Litsky. Hyman Litsky. Is that his real name? <laughs> okay, of course, of course. H-Y-L-I-T. But you can, you can see Jerry Blavitt being interviewed yeah. and, and High Lit being interviewed about the alleged mafia, because Jerry Blavitt allegedly tried to wipe out his competition by using no, I, I don't, I don't blame him. But the, uh, <laughs> there, just to mention a cultural <laughs> artifact, uh, which is called The In Crowd 1981, is a movie that was made about Jerry Blavitt. It's about Jerry Blavitt. It's not wow. there. It's a really interesting movie because it's about this Jewish kid who can't dance, because Jews can't <laughs> dance, but he watches okay. bandstand. You know, so he gets wow. finally gets on bandstand and he's dancing with the shiksa of his dreams. Anyway, it's a really interesting movie, but it's really about Jerry Blavitt and how he hated Dick Clark because of uh, uh, yeah, bandstand band started in West Philly, right? Like 46. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, great discussion. Likewise. Yeah, 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 I agree. Oh, oh, one more thing here at the end. Uh, you know, we got off into some other things, but uh, about Philly itself uh, and you both can answer. Uh, what what would be a way to rejuvenate the city, uh, to bring it back to, to where have, it was? Have Jim Goad go back to church. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I mean, this, one of the main reasons I voted for Trump in 2016, despite his attitude, was that he promised economic nationalism and bringing back our industrial base. I think, and you know, whether it's really, I think EMJ and I agreed somewhat that uh, all these things, the industrial base is eroded, the economy has been devastated. And I, I don't know if AI is gonna be avoidable, but for the time being, cease the globalization of the economy, bring the factories back to North Philly, and maybe that would help. Well, thank you both for coming. I'd love to have you both back at the same time. Maybe not the same subject, but you're both yeah. Philly guys, so you have a little bit of camaraderie, but there's also the the headbutting too. So I think well, it's that's, a, that's think Philly, though, man. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's Philly. Philly. Yeah, I, if, if, yeah. if, if we were on a street corner, I would have beat the shit out of you. Try it. Try it. I'm I'm right, right. Right. That's all right. I got steel in my head, and I've never been knocked down for one punch in my life. Out, all right, e. Michael Catholic Jones, all right, all right, Jim Catholic Gold. Boy. It was a pleasure. Merry Christmas, okay. Happy New Year's as well. Boy. Thank you so right. much. See you. Peace. Peace out. Oh my God. Okay, that was more fun than even I thought it could be. <laughs>